It's Bletchley Park on the 26th of June 2013. 50 distinguished guests, including members of Sir Maurice Wilkes' family, mark the centenary of the birth of this pioneer, some say the pioneer, of British computing. On display are the very first living and breathing parts of the reconstruction of his most famous creation, EDSAC. The full machine is due to be installed and running in the museum in a couple of years' time. And what, what have you got working now? Maurice Wilkes's son, Anthony, gets his first look at the machine. See counting? That's counting. These four here are decoding the address lines. I think he was in favour of the replica project. We, we weren't sure whether he would be, uh, because he didn't always approve of such things. But uh, I think he, he did become very interested in this, and uh, we're all great supporters of it now. The National Museum of Computing is hosting the event. Dr David Hartley, the director, worked with Wilkes and took over from him as director of the Cambridge University Computing Service. It all began, of course, in his career as an academic at Cambridge. Um, read the Tripos, uh, got a first, got a better Tripos than Alan Turing, of which he was very proud. <laughs> um, they had a lifelong unfriendship, I think is the way to put it. Very, very different people, both brilliant people, of course, in their own ways. Morris is academic subjects were start off mathematics, he then went into physics and uh, did a PhD. Um, he sort of became an engineer somewhere down the line uh, and, and indeed a manager and I, perhaps because I'm a manager myself, think that is one of the most important attributes that Morris had. When Morris was still involved as a student, a PhD student in Cambridge in physics, uh, he got involved with a new organisation set up called the Mathematical Laboratory. Uh, and he went to work for it. From that moment onward, he was passionate about the mission that he wanted to follow. He saw all these scientists in Cambridge doing com computations using hand calculators and said, I want to do something to help them. It must be possible to build a machine that takes the drudgery out of that work. And Morris went off to the States one day and he went to the Moore School for lectures. He was inspired by those lectures and he came back to Cambridge saying, I'm going to build the computer. So he came back, built the EDSAC, uh, remarkable achievement, and of course, as I say, the rest is history. He wrote a letter, to, I'm not quite sure to whom, but probably most heads of departments in university, saying in crazy type terms, I have built a computer, you're welcome to come and use it, uh, whoever you are. And no one ever got refused, apparently, um, uh, their, their computer time they're asking for. Every, everyone was always encouraged. Well, the first time I heard about um, EDSAC is when I did my PhD here and I used the uh, mathematical laboratory, as it was then called, to do some Fortran programming. And people just remembered the EDSAC with great fondness because it was, uh, they were very proud that it was the first usable computer in the world. He invented microprogramming. <coughs> he built a parallel bit slice machine, which was one of the first to do so. Um, he had read-only memory. All sorts of things you now take for granted, he did. What he wasn't as a software engineer, uh, I say that in case you ever see a video that was made of him and the interviewer said, well, what, what, are you? What, what were you? What do you are you, Morris? He said, perhaps a software engineer. Now, those of you who know him, <laughs> he was a great, great man, but he was the world's worst programmer. And I have a story to do with that, not the one that started the project off, but the one that nearly killed it. Because in the same interview that he gave when he described his, his abilities in programming, uh, he was asked the question about, in the history of computing context, so what about rebuilding EDSAC? And he said, no, no, he said, I'm against that. Wrong thing to do. Absolutely no point in doing it. Waste of time, waste of money. If a historian wanted to find out about how EDSAC worked, all they had to do is look in the archives. <laughs> well, we did. And he was wrong. He was so, so wrong, was Morris, in that one. He could be wrong. And I finally talked to David Hartley and said, oh, you know, how much would it cost to actually uh, rebuild the EDSAC? I said, I've got no idea at all. No one ever thought of doing it because we all thought it was impossible. Oh, he said, why don't you find out and let me know? And that's an incredible invitation for funding that I've ever seen before or since. And he said, well, I don't know, but I'll find out. And uh, because he's associated with the uh, computer, uh, the British Computer Society, he knew the right people. So we spent six months, a team of us from the Computer Conservation Society, particularly Chris Burton, and started to do the research. We went to the archives, we dug out all we could find, 
to find out what would it cost to answer Herman's question. And the answer we came up with after six months was it would take three years to do and cost a quarter million pounds. Well, I was the first uh, funder of it, but I soon got a, a group of people together who helped me fund it. I spent weeks and months not telling him <laughs> uh, until we got the final OK from Herman Hauser to go ahead with the project. And I thought we'd better tell him now, because if you heard, heard from someone else other than me, I'd be in dead trouble. Um, uh, and, and so we, we did tell him, and uh, he said, uh, I'd steer clear of that if I were you. <laughs> when my father was writing his memoirs, this was in Massachusetts in the 80s, shortly after he'd retired from the lab, my mother noticed that the, the phrase, I lost no time, I lost no time to do this, I lost no time in doing that, cropped up again and again in the memoirs, and um, she suggested that he give that title to the book. Well, in fact, he didn't give that title to the book, but he might have done it, it was very apt. Um, and it's certainly true that in his early career, and indeed later on, um, he was a man of terrific energy, uh, uh, as, as he'd been intimated, and uh, as someone who knew exactly where he was going. His, his first passion, uh, though, was radio. And if you wanted to be a radio ham, uh, you had to pass two tests. One was in radio theory and the other was in Morse. Morse is forgotten today. When I was a boy it was not quite forgotten and actually my father taught me some Morse. But I remember some of the mnemonics that went with it. My father was very particular that it should be taught in the way music is taught, that is to say as, uh, as rhythms, to da da da, um, rather than as dots and dashes. And there was, I, I remember da da da, which is to hell with it which is L. Um, um, da, 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 God save the Queen, Q. Um, I bought two exhibits. The first is, is this, which I'll, um, I'll put out for people to see. It's a tape. Um, it's from the EDSAC to my father on uh, his election to the Royal Society, and he gives his congratulations. Um, uh, perhaps I'll put that there for people to marvel at. Um, <laughs> the other thing is a, is a, a, a book. It's an exercise book um, from my father's school. I came across this after he died, um, and I might, have, I might have missed it, but I opened the, uh, the front cover and saw uh, a flap with the words, lift the flap, and I lifted it and it said, I would like Anthony to have this book uh, after I die. I think it might amuse him. And it's, it's all his, his, his jokes and things uh, he used for speech making and so on. There's some wonderful things in here. Uh, um, you can't have it. Um, <laughs> Andrew Herbert was once director of Microsoft then, Research uh, in the UK. Where we are today, June, and we have our first working chassis, um, the, the collection here. Um, some have been working for a while, others were coaxed into life, and there's definitely a, a few scary moments last Wednesday, which was the last date those of us working on the clock system had to get together, I think, half an hour. He's now the EDSAC Reconstruction the, uh, Project uh, Manager, responsible for coordinating the team of volunteers who've laid on the display today. Our hope is to start erecting um, complete racks um, at the museum here um, in the autumn of this year and we're targeting the autumn of 2015 for, for completion of the machine. The valves you can see there, um, our store man Alan um, gets those. Um, many of them come in boxes labelled 1943. He just unwrapped one for me today, which was wrapped in newspaper, the Montreal Standard, Saturday, July the 15th, 1944. So that's the date that valve was put in a, a cardboard box. Um, you could be very happy that uh, by using new components because uh, Wilkes was insistent that the computer had to have high um, maintenance uh, usability, so he insisted on new components. They were all purchased, and much of his budget went for that. He got the valves free, but they were also new, right. in the sense that they were available in packets, uh, original surplus to wartime needs. Right. So you could be very happy that you're using. Yeah, that's <laughs> it. Just to very run, run you very quickly through how much of the machine we understand, the color code here is things in green actually exist. They're all in that rack for the purpose of demonstration. 
things in yellow are things we know how to build, um, and indeed there's usually a green one of them in the, in the green set, and things in orange have someone working on them, so there's reasonable hope we'll end up with one of, one of those. Things that have labels and are white, we know we're going to need it, but no one's working on it yet. Things which are white with no label are a mystery, um, but I'm sure <laughs> some of them are. Peter Lawrence is one of the few people alive who used the machine in the late 40s and early 50s. Each, each pulse the machine does one operation. He's built the clock pulse generator, the fundamental metronome which times the workings of the machine. It's driving the digit pulse generator, which will send the stream of bits round the circuits. Decoders for 16, well, eight. John Pratt shows the largest section running, the address decoder, which decides which memory locations are to be addressed, and with a little bit of modern electronics to monitor what's going on. In the arithmetic unit, you want to add bigger numbers, so you have to have a full adder, and a full adder is made up of two half adders. Mm -hmm. And Nigel Benny shows that the machine can the indeed already carry, add numbers. You can see if you watch that without understanding it too much, you'll notice that they disappear and you get a carry bit appearing at the top. Well, usually in the history of computing, each machine designs its successor. It's not obvious you get to go backwards and design the predecessors. Um, and as you can see, our volunteers are able to use modern electronics, transistors and so forth, to drive and build test harnesses for all these chassis which is not a luxury that Walton's team would have had. Um, and so uh, we're, we're, we're building EDSAC in a, a much more convenient environment than the pioneers, and so my respect for them um, goes up tremendously. And on that note again, let's remind ourselves it's the 100th anniversary of the birth of, birth of Maurice Waltz, computing pioneer. Thank you very much. My, my father talked about this uh, once or twice, and he was very uh, uh, clear that, that what is the truth that there are only analog circuits, <laughs> and uh, that getting um, analog circuits to behave digitally was one of the big deals, one of the big things he had to. And you're, you're quite right about the um, about the, the radar helping him with that. Uh, and I think it's, it's probably true to say that when he started on the EDSAC, he was he was a, a world expert on that very thing. Part of course from the Bletchley people, but that was all hush hush. Yes, yeah. and it's, so I know that's an interesting point to pick up, and that there is absolutely no Colossus input to EDSAC um, because Colossus was hush hush at that point. And indeed, um, the two machines will be interesting to compare because EDSAC is what a radar engineer builds if you ask him to make a computer, and Colossus is what a post office engineer builds if you ask him to build a computer. <laughs> and the mindsets are completely different. There aren't very many relays in EDSAC. <laughs> Oh, I have a very simple role is to thank everybody for coming today and thank for some people in particular. I think huge thanks to Andrew for enthusing, cajoling, telling off, encouraging and actually persuading the sheer amount of work that's gone into the project so far. It is absolutely quite phenomenal. I'm involved in a very slight minor level. I see the invoices, I write checks for thousands of capacitors. <laughs> but seeing it actually built today is really quite fantastic. <coughs> and thank you very much, Andrew. Thank you for all the. Thank you. Penultimate thoughts come from Maurice Wilkes's book of jokes. He had rather a mischievous sense of humour and he liked um, pulling the leg of the clergy and, and clerical affairs and one of the jokes is just a short passage from the Acts of the Apostles uh, uh, written out and obviously considered funny as it stands. And there were some that said one thing and some that said another. And the multitude were much confused, for the greater part thereof knew not wherefore they were come together. An apt commentary may be on early meetings of the EDSAC volunteers trying to piece together the immense jigsaw puzzle that he left behind. But final words are from EDSAC itself to Maurice Wilkes. The staff and students read by his daughter Helen of the University Mathematical Laboratory join me in sending you hearty congratulations on your election. I am glad it happened before I retired. EDSAC. That's wonderful. He was really proud of that.